In this video, I'm going to talk about uh, what to work, uh, the motivations behind what to work, uh, various models, uh, inferential schemes, and its extension to uh, doc to work or how do you represent a document as a vector. Uh, that's going to be the focus of this particular lecture. So before we get into what to work, uh, let's see how um, the word and things were learned uh, you know, uh, uh, before the invention of neural language models. What you see in this case is called the term frequency matrix. Uh, each row is basically corresponding to a particular document. The columns are the unique words in your vocabulary. So in this case, you see uh, that uh, word W1 occur twice in document D1. This is basically a term frequency um, representation of your corpus. So uh, let's say there are n documents and uh, V is the number of uh, vocabulary size of the vocabulary you have, I call this as a sigma. Uh, some interesting properties of this matrix are uh, it's going to be pretty sparse um, because uh, generally speaking, uh, the vocabulary will be much, much larger than uh, the average length of the document. Uh, therefore, you'll see lots of zeros in the rows. Uh, and secondly, uh, this particular term frequency representation doesn't consider the semantics. Um, for example, if I have a sentence like Obama greets the press, that's one sentence. Uh, consider another sentence uh, that uh, goes as is, go a as follows. Uh, Obama spoke with the journalist. Now, semantically, both were, both sentences are, are very similar, but uh, there is very little in terms of the overlap between the words. Since the term frequency you know, representation uh, considers the document similarity in terms of the word overlapping, uh, it doesn't capture the um, uh, semantic similarity between them. So one way to get to that point is by um, uh, recognizing that this matrix is going to be very sparse. Uh, therefore, we could have a low rank approximation uh, to this matrix. So, uh, so you, if you can represent or approximate your sigma uh, with uh, by truncating the eigenvalues in your in the SVD, uh, you get this representation, and you can notice that uh, the right eigen uh, right eigen uh, matrix V uh, that's of size uh, mod V V is basically the vocabulary size, and D is basically the light and dimension. Um, then you can interpret the jth uh, the jth uh, uh, row of this particular matrix as uh, the word amending corresponding to the jth word, right? Uh, nevertheless, it doesn't, it still considers that, you know, it, it's called the bag of words model, wherein you don't consider the ordering of the words in a document. You simply see, see a document as an unordered collection of words. That's why it's called as bag of words model. Okay. So definitely it's an improvement compared to the term frequency documentation. Uh, in fact, this is called as a latent semantic uh, analysis or the indices used by uh, the embeddings used by the VJ and uh, can be used as indices in information retrieval. So the way you want to retrieve documents is by you know, getting all the documents that are similar uh, by looking at the dot product between uh, the query or the document of interest versus uh, the document that exists in the collection. That's basically uh, um, you know, the classical way of uh, representing the you know, word embeddings. Uh, but it in, in, in language uh, <coughs> processing or language understanding, um, a word's meaning is understood by the context in which it appears. <coughs> um, that means, you know, for example, if you say a word like a dog, how do you understand a word dog? Uh, you and I understand the word dog because we know how it gets used uh, and uh, you know what forms and what shapes uh, does it take. But for a machine to understand a word dog, it needs to see its context, how it gets used, and based on that, it derives its meaning. So, uh, <clears throat> so then how do we map this code proposition and that um, a meaning is basically encoded by the context in which it appears? Uh, we can take it as follows. Let's say we got uh, a, a target word or a focus word WT, uh, which is what we like to understand. Um, and, the and we have a left context and the right context. So the words preceding uh, the focus word and the words succeeding the uh, current target word 
we call that as a right context. So I like to say that uh, the probability that I see the word dog at the tth position in my in the sequence is uh, given the words uh, that are occurring to the left and the words that are occurring to the right. Um, I like to maximize that probability. In other words, what we are trying to say is that you now given the context word, I like to maximize my probability of seeing the target word. You know, that's a statement, that's a translation of this you know, very core uh, linguistic uh, you know, intuition or a principle and map it to uh, a probabilistic statement. But even here, we did not specify exactly how to model this particular probability. Uh, one way to do that is you know, assume that each word and each context is represented by a fixed dimensional vector. Then I say that the probability is basically proportional to the exponential of the dot product between um, the target words uh, vector representation versus the context words vector representation. Okay. So if you forget about the exponential for a while, you are saying that the probability is basically proportional to uh, the similarity between the word embeddings. Uh, and how do you want to drive these vector embeddings? It's exactly this particular idea. If two words appear in the same context, then they have to be similar. So this is called as the distributional hypothesis. Uh, so the problem that we saw with the temp frequency representation is that you no know, words that occur in a similar context might be separated uh, in the in the in the vector space given by uh, the temp frequency representation. Whereas in this particular case, we enforce um, uh, we enforce the word embeddings to be occupying a similar space if they occur in similar context. Um, that's a key difference. Uh, or rather the Cree principle upon which uh, what to work uh, works. Well, there are mu multiple models to learn the word embeddings. Uh, this is one of the models. Uh, let's go specifically. <clears throat> uh, so this is called the continuous back of words model. Now what you notice here is uh, the words corresponding to the context that you see on the left hand side and the target word that you like to predict. In fact, we pose this as a classification problem. And the input layer or the hidden layer has d dimensions. So this is the, uh, the context embeddings. So we could have just one word, we could have multiple words that form our context. Finally, we map all the context words to uh, the uh, intermediate representation, which is the d dimensional embedding. And this d dimensional embedding drives our classification task. Um, so again, you see this is basically one hard coded. So if WT is basically dog, you just see a label corresponding to a dog as one and the rest all the labels are zero. This is one of the classification tasks that we perform. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a, a continuous back of representation as, term, as, given, as the name is given by uh, no, Mikalo et al, uh, which is the no, seminal paper in neural embeddings. There is another model uh, which is called the you know, skip gram model. Uh, instead of predicting the target word given the context word, we, we inverse the problem. So we are given the target word, then we like to predict uh, the words in the context. Okay. Um, and for example, I could try to predict, let's say, two words, three words, uh, you now given the target word. So your context size could vary. Uh, so nevertheless, you have you no know, WT is basically your input size. Um, uh, again, in this case, the input is one hard coded and the intermediate representation is basically D. So you go from V to D and you go from D to mod C mod V times one. Um, in this case, uh, the, again, it's a classification, but you're also saying that in which context I'm actually predicting. Um, <clears throat> uh, if, you, if you further simplify the model, you could simply say that you have the target word is, uh, is given then you're trying to predict one word out of the context word. <coughs> so typically you choose uh, your context size to be, let's say five or anywhere between five and 10. You sample R words at random and just, just, just try to predict one of that particular R. So in that sense, you see that this is a, you know, one, one, uh, given one target word, you're trying to predict one word in the given context. Uh, again, you make the following representation. Now, given the target word, you're trying to predict uh, the context word. Uh, the probability is again proportional to uh, the similarity between uh, the context word and the input word. 
no, here VWC is uh, the embedding of the context and VWT is embedding of the target word. What we like to learn is basically the VWT. Okay, this is called as a skip gram model. But uh, <clears throat> the general problem with either CBOW and the skip gram model as such is that you know, if you look at a CBOW model, you, know, you have to make a uh, it's one of V classifications. Typically, this V is going to be very large, something like 10 to the power of or 5 or 10 to the power of 7. So, <clears throat> so computing the normalization constant in the denominator, uh, because this is just proportionality proportional to the kernel, if you really want to compute the probability, you have to calculate the denominator. Then the denominator needs to run across all the context words, all the vocab words in the vocabulary, which is a very expensive proposition. So, uh, Mikolov et al. proposed uh, uh, instead of dealing this as a one of the classification problems, you approximate the softmax with a uh, with a tree representation. Now that's called as the hierarchical softmax. Let's go to the original paper and see you know, what they talk about and come back to this representation. Uh, so this is the original skip gram proposed by Mikolov et al. Um, again, what you notice is that T is the context size and WT is the target word. Uh, any T, any J you now belonging to the context that is WT plus J you now belongs to the context word. What you like to maximize is the you know, joint probability of seeing the context you now given the target word. That's what you like to maximize. Uh, so you pose this as a no, uh, no classification problem and particularly the softmax uh, in the context of neural language models you call this as a softmax uh, because the denominator is basically the normalization constant just by doing a softmax operation you convert unnormalized scores into uh, probabilities. Uh, this uh, VWI is the word embedding that we like to learn VWO dash is the word embeddings either of the context or of the, of the word but on the, out, on the uh, output side. We are, we are interested in the input embeddings. Now that are, that's what we take as uh, word embeddings. Uh, <clears throat> as your vocabulary basically gets large 10 to the power of 5 or 10 to the power of 7, the denominator is very expensive to compute. So you need, pract yeah. you need practical alternatives to compute that. In hierarchical softmax, the core proposition is to uh, say that in, instead of uh, making the W computations where W is your vocabulary size, you simply want to compute log W of base 2 uh, comp computations. Now, so you want to reduce the number of computations that are required to you know, compute. Now, before we uh, inspect this particular equation, uh, let's go back to various three representations of uh, sequences. Um, now suppose let's say you are given you know, the four words, the four words constitute your vocabulary. Uh, now further assume that n is basically the you know, frequency of occurrence of uh, this particular word w1. In this case my objective is to uh, instead, of, uh, 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 instead of treating every word as <coughs> as uh, representing with one hard coding, I like to come up with a tree representation uh, wherein uh, uh, to reach to encode a particular word I should spend minimum amount of time you not know, decoding it. What I mean to say is that uh, in this particular case uh, I have a tree representation of uh, the words um, I, in order to reach the word I traverse from the root node. Now obviously if a word occurs most of the time I should spend minimal amount of time traversing from the root node to that particular node. Uh, this is the principle behind Huffman tree construction. Uh, you can see this is some sort of a compression technique. Uh, in this particular case, you notice that the probability, the frequencies are you know, decreasing by a factor of two as you go from W1 to W2, W2 to W3, so on and so forth. <coughs> Huffman tree assigns uh, unique symbols to each word. In this case, W1 is given a symbol one. W2 is basically given a symbol 0, 1. Uh, so on and so forth. Now, essentially it travels to the left or to the right uh, depending on 
uh, whether you hit the terminal node or not. Um, uh, because W1 occurred with the maximum frequency, uh, I like to give a shortest code possible, which is 1 in this case. Now, W2 occurs with the next best frequency uh, in your vocabulary. Therefore, I like to give the next shortest code possible, which is 0, 01. Uh, in that sense, you encoded the words in terms of this particular tree representation. Okay. Uh, now, we like to use this uh, Huffman tree representation to encode our joint probabilities. Okay. Let's go back to this equation. <coughs> So, uh, wi is the input word or the target word that you like to see uh, that is given to you and w is the context word, okay. Uh, for a moment, assume that you have a single context word. So, given the target word, you like to predict the uh, context word. How do you do that? Basically, you traverse uh, uh, from the root node to the context word, okay. Uh, for example, in this case, wi is the input word that is given to you. This nwj is the set of all the nodes that you see uh, that exist in the path from the root to uh, the context word. In other words, uh, in terms of the tree representation, now suppose you like to model the probability of uh, you know, w4 given wi. w is given to you, uh, then the, the, prob the, the probability of w4 given wi is modeled as the product of the probabilities along the uh, along the path. So in this case, you see this is a one intermediate node, this is another intermediate node, and the terminal node is basically W4. In that sense, you need to have vector representations for all the intermediate nodes and the root node uh, too. Uh, that's how you model your uh, Huffman tree. The Huffman tree is, uh, the structure of the tree is purely determined by the frequency of the vocabulary that you have. Once you have the Huffman tree, then you represent uh, intermediate nodes with their corresponding word embeddings. That basically determines your context. Once you have representations for the word embeddings and the structure is given to you, then you can, re then you can recursively go to the left or to the right to reach the corresponding terminal node, which is the word of context uh, that is of interest to you. Okay? Uh, you notice that everywhere you make splits in the tree, uh, the right is basically P1, therefore the left has to be 1 minus P1. In this case, once you have descended up to this particular node, if you want to reach W2, the probability of going from the root 2 to W2 is 1 minus P1 times P21. The probability of reaching W4 then is the sum, the product of all the uh, probabilities that you observe. So 1 minus P1 times 1 minus P2 times 1 minus P3. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> Uh, in the paper, it's a, it's a, this equation is basically uh, what is given uh, graphically in the other slide. So this is a very cryptic notation to uh, denote the probabilities encoded by the particular tree. Uh, remember, the Huffman tree is one way to represent the structure. There could be many other ways. So in Mikolov et al, they mentioned that they tried with several different representations of the tree and uh, Huffman, Huffman tree seems to be uh, doing a good job. Okay, um, <clears throat> so in that sense, the hierarch hierarchical softmax is one way to <clears throat> one way to uh, um, deal with the computational complexity of uh, uh, you know, performing uh, W computations uh, with the high hierarchical softmax. You compute uh, com uh, computations that in the that are in the order of log W. Uh, nevertheless, this is uh, uh, still a complex problem to solve. Uh, so, Mikulov et al. in their original paper proposed uh, a, a, a different approach called as Lake for sampling as an alternative to hierarchical softmax. The key principle in negative uh, sampling is, is as follows. So, let's assume that uh, S is basically some kind of a scoring function that exists with you, uh, which gives, given <coughs> the contextual uh, embeddings and the target word embeddings, there is some way to score it. In fact, this S of WC, WT is, could be just, just the kernel uh, that we have seen before. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, no, given uh, the vector embeddings for the context and for the target word, no, this could be the scoring function. Okay. Exponential of the dot product between these two. Let's say that's our scoring function. 
Now, given the access to the scoring function, what we like to say is that whenever the target word appears in the context that you have seen in the data, that score has to be greater than or equal to uh, the target, the, the, the uh, a distractor context and the target word. What we, mean, what we mean by distractor context is that uh, in real life these are not going to occur. You know, uh, as an example say uh, you take a, uh, let's say the target word you, you want to predict is let's say purr and this WC is let's say the cat. Okay, So cat and purr definitely may occur in your corpus more often than not versus take a distractor word like a moon and purr. Okay? So in that sense you can see that uh, uh, moon is acting like a distractor. So you want to learn your embedding such that uh, <coughs> the scoring score between words that exist in your corpus in terms of the context and the target should score higher compared to the score between the, ta the target word and a distractor or noise. Okay? Uh, <coughs> So uh, what you are doing then essentially is that you are turning the so-called unsupervised problem even though you pose this as a classification problem there is nothing like a labeled data. So you create additional labels uh, where you say that D is all set of all the data all the pairs of context and, and, and target data that exists in your corpus and uh, this should be D dash. D dash is set of all the uh, distractor target pairs. So you give a label of plus one to uh, the context target pairs that you see and give a label of negative 1 or 0 depending on how you pose it and that's your you know, D dash collection and then this essentially becomes a binary classification problem. <coughs> uh, this also goes by the name uh, learning to rank. <coughs> Why this is called negative sampling? Because uh, you are simply injecting noise into the model and, uh, and making sure that uh, noise is attributed, noise is given a label, so your model tries to uh, upward uh, uh, the actual context and target pairs that it has seen uh, come to, uh, uh, to the noise. Okay? That's the core, core idea behind negative sampling. Uh, you can also see that negative sampling is an uh, approximation to the softmax function asymptotically. Uh, the negative sampling uh, approximate the softmax problem. So uh, essentially you are actually solving a different problem. It's not the softmax but it's approximation to the softmax albeit it has to be a lot more simpler to compute and implement. Uh, you can also see uh, negative sampling as a as a type of uh, noise contrast estimation techniques. The problem that we saw with uh, softmax is that the partition function or the normalization content is very expensive to compute. So uh, the, the native, uh, the noise contrastive uh, estimation techniques address the problem by head on, uh, head on. What I mean to say is that this is the, if, if log p of x, which is the log of the uh, normalized prop, uh, log of the probability density function is log of the unnormalized density plus some constant, uh, not exactly constant, but uh, some function of the partition function. You also treat uh, the log of the partition function as also as a parameter and try to learn it. So a uh, negative sampling doesn't explicitly compute the negative uh, uh, the log of the partition function but it definitely addresses that problem um, uh, and there are many other techniques which are which, are, which are fall under the umbrella of, the umbrella of uh, uh, no, no, noise contrast estimation that's a different uh, you know, topic altogether but nevertheless negative sampling is a, an approximation to the softmax uh, depending on how you sample your negative samples you know, that method could be very efficient okay let's go back to the paper so <clears throat> Uh, basically, this is what uh, this is the optimization problem, or this is the loss function. Um, no, it's not exactly loss function, but this is the optimization function. The function that negative sampling tries to uh, uh, maximize. Uh, uh, what? You, how do you understand this particular term? Um, so there is a paper by, uh, or rather, there is a short note by. Uh, There is a short paper by uh, you know, Goldberg and Levy where they try to explain uh, the intuition behind negative sampling and how exactly the, the Mikulov et al got the negative sampling equation. 
As I said, fundamentally, uh, the idea behind negative sampling is to uh, turn unsupervised problem into a supervised problem, wherein you give a label of one uh, for all the the pairs of words, uh, target word and context that you see. In this case, W is the word, target word, C is the context word. And for all the you no know, data that belongs to the noise, you give a label zero, okay? Mm, if the word context pair did not come from the data, and that is a, a, a distractor or a noise, you give a label zero. That's the bottom line. <coughs> so what you like to maximize is basically the joint probability of you no, know, having seen, <coughs> uh, you, in other words, you like to learn the word emptiness for the uh, for the context in W such that this probability is basically maximized. So, if all the individual records are assumed to be independent, then the joint likelihood of the entire corpus and the noise is basically the product of the individual um, you know, likelihoods. So, this is the, the this term is a likelihood term contributed by. Uh, the positive examples. This is the um, likelihood contributed by the negative examples. And uh, uh, if you turn the problem into uh, just plainly in terms of uh, uh, you know, given context and uh, word, whether it's coming from uh, the noise or uh, the, the positive example or the negative example, you try to represent that in terms of p of d equals to 1. Now, for example, in the tree representation, I have used and now P to represent uh, a symbol of 1 and 0 to represent a symbol of 0. It's, it's equivalent to that. Uh, um, uh, since this is a maximization problem, maximizing the log is also equivalent. So if you apply log of the max, uh, and it's equivalent to solving max of the log. Um, so, uh, and the product, product, product becomes summation. With a, after a little bit of you know, algebra, you, know, you get to this particular point. Uh, uh, essentially, this is a sigmoid function, basically which turns uh, this unnormalized scores into normalized probabilities. Uh, uh, again, you see that you know, this is a contribution by the positive examples. This is a contribution by the negative examples. Uh, <clears throat> uh, suppose that you just have one record for a moment. Then the summation becomes just uh, a, a single term. Uh, you would see the log sigma vc vw. Uh, that's a contribution by a single positive example. And you know, let's say you have a this is a summation. Um, uh, if uh, this d dash is coming from a certain population of the noise, you can replace the summation with its expectation. Then you're talking about the expectation or the population version of, of the likelihood term. Okay. Uh, then you can immediately see that that is exactly the equation given by uh, given in uh, Mekelow's paper. Right. Now you see that you know, for a single positive example, uh, this is the contribution given by uh, given by um, uh, the positive examples. This is the expectation of the log likelihood contributed by the negative examples. You like to maximize the joint probability. Uh, that's the optimization function that negative sampling tries to optimize. So, uh, so it, it's it's uh, uh, finally turns out that it is a binary classification problem because you have an explicit la explicit labels on every context uh, target word pair, whether it's coming from the target or coming from uh, the a noise or the distractor. Um, so obviously, uh, the word and things will learn to uh, know, score, uh, put, uh, the, uh, put the score corresponding to the actual target uh, word pair more than um, the target pair belonging to the noise. Um, so this is a very neat technique. In general, this can be applied in many other situations, not just in learning word and things. Whenever you have uh, you have a difficult optimization to problem to solve, uh, you can pose this as a, you can turn the t into a uh, no supervised binary classification problem. So uh, after having worked and estimated the model, you now these are the word emptiness learned by this particular model. It's uh, <clears throat> What's interesting learned is that uh, the word emptiness you now puts all the, uh, 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 these are all the countries, the word emptiness of all the countries form almost like a cluster and uh, all the word emptiness belonging to all the capitals uh, belong to one particular cluster. What you also notice is that the vector differences are almost similar uh, between country and uh, at its capital. That is to say that if I do a vector difference between China and Beijing and I add it to Russia, then I get Moscow. In other words, uh, what, is, what is basically you know, China minus Beijing you know, plus 
Russia, I get Moscow. So, uh, these word embeddings not only maintain the semantic representations at the word level, but they also encode the differences. In that sense, you can perform uh, vector additions and vector, vector uh, differences and they would encode certain similarity. Now, in this case, I can, uh, this vector difference encodes uh, uh, the, uh, the, that encodes the capital of. Now, given two objects, let's say given a country, uh, given a country and its capital, uh, I could move from country to capital or capital to country. That's the, uh, that's what these vector embeddings learn. Uh, there are several heuristics that uh, Mikulov et al. use in learning the word embeddings. Uh, one of the problems that we see in uh, in the corpus uh, uh, characteristics is that there are lots of uh, you know, frequently occurring words which are not informative. For example, words like uh, the, a, you know, they don't occur that often, uh, therefore they are not informative. Um, uh, so for that reason, um, uh, and not only that, uh, in, they also modify the uh, unigram distribution, that is the frequency of the words is basically modified. So they take uh, the general frequency distribution of the words and raise it to the power of 3 fourth and normalize it. Uh, they, their claim was that it performed uh, 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 better than the regular unigram uh, because the, you have to sample the native words, therefore you need to have access to the distribution of the words. Uh, uh, they, they do further subsample uh, frequently occurring words. Um, <clears throat> again, the idea is to uh, not give a lot of credence to uh, very high frequency words which are not informative, such as uh, propositions and articles. Okay. Um, that's about you know, word to vec. Uh, you know, the ideas can be extended to you know, phrases. And one interesting extension that Mikula et al. did is to now embed documents in vector spaces. Uh, just as the way it, uh, words uh, having vector representation gives us a lot of uh, uh, tools to play with, uh, uh, such as in, <coughs> in, uh, uh, in information retrieval, sentiment analysis, so on and so forth, uh, having uh, a fixed dimensional representation for uh, documents also works in the same way. Um, Let's look at uh, the paragraph to VEC or doc to VEC paper. Um, this goes by the name Distributed Representations of Sentences and Documents uh, by Mikolo and Lee. Uh, again, the idea is actually very similar to uh, the word VEC model. Um, it's almost the same, right? Uh, in the regular you know, uh, CBOG representation of the word to VEC model, uh, you have the context words that are given to you, then you're trying to classify. Uh, or you are trying to predict the target word. The prediction of the target word is posed as a classification problem. Uh, now, the, the, the difference that you, that is, uh, the, the extension to the regular word to vec model is that now you have some, um, a mod p times you no know, d dimensional, uh, d dash dimensional uh, embedding that maps a paragraph to its, its, uh, its vector representation. Uh, so that's the only difference. Uh, everything else remains the same. Now, how do you learn this particular model? No, you sample, given a particular paragraph, you sample the words in the, in the order given, in, in the same order, and then try to predict the next word. Uh, the rest of the process is basically the same. In other words, uh, you again treat this as a one of V class, one of uh, W or one of V classification problems. Uh, the only difference is that uh, you are sampling the words you know, given a paragraph, okay? Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, the technology is different. Uh, this is called as continuous bag of representation in the word to vec model. This is called as a distributional memory model uh, in paragraph to vec model. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so that's the uh, no, only difference between paragraph to vec and a uh, word to vec. Uh, just as the way uh, no, uh, uh, this classification problem is hard uh, in terms of uh, uh, com uh, computing the softmax, uh, you could use negative sampling too. The same idea are applicable. You can you do hierarchical softmax, you can do negative sampling to infer the paragraph vectors. Uh, just as the way we have a skipgram model uh, in word to vec we could also have a skipgram equivalent in paragraph to vec model. Um, that is as follows. Uh, so you have, you have a paragraph vector or you have a paragraph ID and the paragraph embeddings are given. What you're saying is that given the paragraph, I'd like to predict uh, 
uh, the context. In this case, you don't maintain the ordering of the context. You simply say that I like to predict you know, two words or three words at random that are sampled from the document. Okay. Uh, because the, the word ordering is not maintained when you're trying to predict the context given the paragraph, this is called as distributed bag of word model. Uh, but but uh, it's slightly uh, <clears throat> inconvenient uh, to give that particular name because in the regular uh, word to work uh, scheme of things, this is called as a scoop brand model. Okay, but in the context of parrot to work represent uh, a model, this is called as distributional back of words because the ordering of the context is not given. You are simply trying to predict uh, one uh, one or more than one word at random uh, given the paragraph. So this becomes your paragraph embedding again. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you no. Know, <coughs> the both both uh, word to back and paragraph words are very similar. Um, <coughs> uh, and uh, uh, in in this paper, they have showed that it works very well, and it uh, in information retrieval. For example, in information retrieval problem, you know, I like to you know given a document. My question is to you know get me the top top five you know documents that are similar to what I have. Or you could also give a give your query as a sentence or a, as a paragraph. Now get me the documents that talk about this particular paragraph. Okay, uh, how you could solve the problem? You now take simple dot products between uh, or compute cosine similarity between the documents, the uh, and the query document and all the documents in your corpus, and simply retrieve the documents that are uh, you know, highly similar. Uh, that's one way you could use a word to where, uh, sorry paragraph to where. Another use case of uh, you know, doc is in uh, sentiment analysis. Okay, if labeled data exists uh, with you that says this document has a positive sentiment, this document has a negative sentiment, you just can learn a classifier. The features of the classifier are basically the paragraph embeddings. So that's one use case of uh, uh, you know, doc Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's about it. Um, um, so the you know, paragraph effect is again a very useful uh, representation. Um, uh, there are you know, several different ways you could make that in make a, a, or rather estimate the paragraph to back model. The paragraph uh, for each paragraph in the corpus you give one a hard coded. So you go from p cross one to a d dimensional embedding of the para. You you could concatenate the context and try to predict the embeddings. Okay. So in the paragraph vector model. Uh, the, this is this is the embedding that we like to learn. Okay, uh, you can assume that word to work need not be learned. You could just uh, you know, take the pre-trained word embeddings and only try to learn the paragraph embeddings. That's possible. And there are you know, several alternatives that you could do. Either you, either you could concatenate the you know, paragraph embeddings with uh, the context embeddings, or you take you can take an average. Uh, many other variations are possible. Okay. Nevertheless, uh, uh, it's a it's a very you know, uh, you know, straightforward extension of the word effect model. Okay. All right, that's about it, and thanks for watching.